morning, everyone, and welcome to Bill Green's Maine. I'm fascinated by our first story tonight because it's a story that's not as well known around the old Pine Tree State as it should be. It's set on April 23rd, 1945, just weeks before World War II ended in Europe, and Casco Bay seemed as tranquil as it does today. But a Nazi U-boat lurked less than nine miles from where I'm standing, and it launched a torpedo that blew up an American warship, sending 49 sailors to an icy, watery grave. And then our government covered up the source of that explosion for more than 50 years. The Eagle 56 was a sub-chaser. With a crew of 62, it was towing target buoys in Casco Bay. It sat idling in the water while Navy planes dropped sand-filled bomb casings 500 yards away. Suddenly, an explosion rocked the PE-56, lifting her in the air and splitting her in two. Jack Scagnelli was an engineering officer. The torpedo hit, I was down below in my quarters. It was right after noontime, uh, chow, and we went down, I went down to, uh, to catch a few minutes uh, of sleep. And by the time I got out of the bunk and closed my eyes, the explosion happened, which physically picked me up and threw me up against the bulkhead, and I received my scalp wound as a result of that. And then uh, all my energies were spent in trying to get off the ship. 49 of 62 on board would die. Life and death were separated by inches and luck. When my relief came, uh, Frederick Mickelson, uh, he apologized because he was 15 yeah. minutes late. Oh. And what's 15 minutes when you're out to sea? And uh, 14 minutes after I was relieved, the torpedo hit. And poor Fred, he was on watch and he didn't make it. Four by four boards used to shore up the ship saved more than one life. Survivors scrambled into the water and looked for anything to hold on to. I d crawled up the fantail and, and jumped off of where the, tor the, the uh, depth charge racks were. That's when I saw the four by four in the water and, you know, I knew that that was my lifesaver. If the four by four hadn't been there, I wouldn't be here because the water was 38 degrees that morning. Historians believe the bow of the ship bobbed just underwater and went down last. The stern raised up, and that's where all but one of the survivors were. As they scrambled to safety, they saw an unbelievable sight. P, uh, uh, Oscar was right behind me, and he said, Hey, Breeze, look, there's a sub. And I looked off the, the port quarter, and sure enough, there she was. But we were too interested in getting off because it was tilting steeper and steeper until it went down, you know, perfectly vertical. American ships like the destroyer Selfridge were in the area and headed to the Sinking Eagle. Its surviving crew was fighting hypothermia in the frigid sea. Fifteen minutes after we went over the side, why Oscar said, hey Breeze, there's a ship. I thought he was lying to me, but I looked over my right shoulder and there was the Selfridge. Most beautiful sight in the world. Suddenly the Selfridge picked up a probable submarine sonar contact and attacked. It ran a figure eight pattern, depth charging the suspected enemy. By nightfall, 10 ships were stalking the enemy. The next day, another destroyer got a sonar contact and attacked off Monhegan. American intelligence tracked the submarine for two weeks until it was sunk off the coast of Rhode Island. Back in Portland, the 13 survivors of the Eagle 56 were being dispersed to the four corners of the globe. Now remember the U-boat had pierced Portland's defenses and a naval inquiry headed by the man who commanded the Port of Portland found that it was not a U-boat attack, but a boiler explosion that sunk the Eagle 56. It was a miscarriage of justice that endured for 57 years. The thing that, the thing that really bothered me was that I was engineering officer and to have pinpointed the cause of that ship, pinpointing the boiler as the reason for the explosion left me pretty sad about it because I realized that that was my responsibility. And if there was a defect, I was the, I was the guy that was on the spot for it. But I knew it was not a boiler explosion. We were in uh, dry dock a few weeks back and we had gone over the boilers, we've gone over the machinery, we've tested the boilers, we put what they call a boiler high pressure test on it and everything worked out fine. So I felt very confident it was not a boiler explosion, but 
They didn't accept that. And they decided, I think it was already prejudged what it was going to be. Thanks to the efforts of Navy historian Paul Lawton, the Navy reversed its findings last year. On June 8th, the three surviving members of the crew gathered for the first time in 57 years. 50 Purple Hearts were awarded posthumously. Breeze, who almost froze to death but came through the ordeal on scratch, did not receive a Purple Heart. Scagnelli and Peterson, who were injured in the explosion, did. The thing I feel real bad about is the poor mothers and fathers that passed away. Not knowing, you know, that the heroes that their sons were. The Eagle 56 was the last U.S. Navy warship sunk in combat in American continental waters during World War II. The loss of 49 sailors was the greatest suffered in New England waters by the U.S. Navy during the war. And sadly, it took 57 years for the story to be told. An interesting sidebar to that story for me comes from a lady I go to church with. She was working for the Navy that day in Portland, and she says she always heard it was a boiler explosion. She'd never heard anything about a U-boat in connection with the sinking of that ship until about five years ago, which means that the cover-up began that very afternoon.